My name is Philippa Perchard. I'm a teacher and I live in England, United Kingdom. I attend Grace regularly online. Today's Bible reading is Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, amen. You can have a seat. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Psalm 133. If you don't have a Bible, slip up your hand and we'll give you a Bible. You can read it this morning. If you don't have one at home, keep it. Also, grace notes, if you didn't get that on the way in, I encourage you to grab one from the Bible cart of people. And down at the bottom is a card that you can fill out with prayer requests and with praises. And we encourage you to fill that out. We pray for those as staff and elders every single week. So great to see you. And make sure I got this set up the right way. Great. Let's start off the sermon um, with a little Hebrew rhyming. You guys up for that? All right, great. Uh, Everybody say the word achim. That's nice. Now say chayim. Okay. So achim is the word in Hebrew found in verse 1 of Psalm 133, translated God's people. Now, strictly... It means brothers, but the pictures in the psalm as one of the songs of ascent that includes these pilgrims walking up to Mount Zion to worship God, it really makes it clear that Achim here includes the brotherhood and sisterhood of God's people. That's why our translation has it as God's people and not just brothers. Now, The other word, chayim, that we just said, is the Hebrew word for life that appears at the end of Psalm 133, even life forevermore, chayim ad haolam, which is basically like life to the limit, or life without end, or eternal life, life forevermore. So in Psalm 133, at the beginning, you've got achim. At the end, you've got Chaim. You hear the rhyme? Isn't that amazing? Sometimes when we read the Psalms, because most of us don't read Hebrew, we miss the fact that they are amazingly constructed poetic compositions that even sometimes rhyme. Achim, God's people. Chaim, eternal life. What connects them? And we find that in verse 1, God's people living together in unity. Now, the big point of Psalm 133 is that godly unity is like heaven on earth. And the psalm makes this point in three ways. First, it literally says that living together in unity is good and pleasant, So we know that not all good things are pleasant, neither are all pleasant things good. We use the example of food. The other day, Amy and I were talking, and she, for some reason, brought up liver as something to eat, and she said, but it's so good for you, it's so nutrient-rich, and I thought, it may be good, but it is not pleasant. The same week, my kids were like, really asking for cotton candy. And I don't know how many of you believe this. I believe that cotton candy is very pleasant to eat, but it's not good. It's not good for you. The psalm here says that dwelling together in unity is good 
and pleasant. It's right in a very deep way, but also very enjoyable when it's right. Achim chayim. Now, the second way that Psalm 133 tells us that godly unity is like heaven on earth is with this imagery of oil. In verse 2, it says, It's like precious oil poured out on the head. Now, to me, dumping an oil slick on your bald spot does not seem super good or pleasant. But if you know your Bible, you know that this oily imagery goes back to the practice or the language of anointing. Specifically, we hear, see here, it's like the oil running down the beard, on Aaron's beard. Aaron was the first high priest for the people of Israel. And the anointing of Aaron happens over in the book of Leviticus. But we learn about how he was to be anointed in the book of Exodus. Now, the book of Exodus starts off with a lot of action and adventure. The people are in slavery, and then God calls Moses to get them out. There's the ten plagues. They get out of Egypt. They get across the Red Sea. They come to Mount Sinai. They get the law. That's like the first half of the book of Exodus. The second half of the book of Exodus is a lot of details and instructions about how the people are to construct the tabernacle, which was the special tent of meeting where God would dwell in the midst of his people. And part of putting together that tabernacle, there's a courtyard and a kind of an outer fence, and there's got the tent itself divided into a couple different areas. There's an altar there for sacrifices, and there are going to be priests who serve. And a whole part of this process is anointing and anointing oil. In fact, in Exodus 30, right in the middle of that section, we find the recipe for the anointing oil that Moses is commanded to apply on the key pieces of the tabernacle and also on the priests who would serve. So the Lord said to Moses, take the following fine spices, liquid myrrh, fragrant cinnamon, calamus, which is sweet flag, if you're into like essential oils at home or something. Cassia, which is like a cinnamon also. And then you mix it all together in a hin of olive oil, like a larger amount of olive oil. And here's what happens. It becomes this fragrant blend. It's the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. And then... As we said, God commands Moses to smear this oil on all the stuff of the tabernacle and also on the priests. But what does this anointing oil mean? Well, the tabernacle is set apart as God's special tent or dwelling on earth. And every detail, instructing us uh, how to build the tabernacle is a detail that instructs us about God's holiness and his desire to be with his people. The priests who serve the tabernacle, they also, just like all the things involved with the tabernacle, the priests themselves were set apart to God in order to be his special representatives on the earth, to mediate between the people and God, to bring God's revelation to the people and to help the people relate to God and help with the sacrifices and managing, dealing with their sin. Now, all this talk about anointing and oil and priests and everything else, if you're interested in this, I would recommend a really helpful series, podcast series put out by the Bible Project people, uh, Tim Mackey and uh, that, that crew, and, and they did like seven podcast episodes about this theme of anointing in the Bible. It's called The Anointed. In fact, Tom Brown, one of our elders, brought it up at our elder meeting this week as part of his devotion for us, and it was super helpful. It actually was like half my sermon prep, just there at an elder meeting, which was great because, uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> anyway, uh, I would recommend that podcast if you want to go deep into this whole subject. They go way deep into the subject. The point, though, is that when we're talking about anointing this imagery, we're talking about the people and the places where heaven and earth meet. It's where God dwells and works. Think about that tabernacle picture. It's where God's desires are actively being carried out on earth instead of resisted. 
So anointing with oil is a physical sign of a spiritual reality, that heaven is overlapping with earth here at this place of the anointing. The kingdom of God is at hand. Achim Chaim, God's people, life everlasting in unity. Now, the third way that the psalmist illustrates that godly unity is like heaven on earth is Mountain Dew. <laughs> Look at it there in verse 3. As if the dew of Mount Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Hermon is at the northernmost part of the promised land. It's a huge mountain, more than 9,000 feet high. Usually it keeps a snow cap all through the summer. And its waters, the snow melt off of Mount Hermon, supplies most of the water for all the region of Israel. So if I was going to show you this mountain on a map, I don't know if this map is super helpful, but maybe it will help once I point out but here's Mount Hermon up here. It's in modern-day Lebanon, the southernmost part of modern-day Lebanon. And here's Jerusalem all the way down here. So you can see where this high area of melting snow sends water down to the headwaters of the Jordan River here, all the way down, feeding the Sea of Galilee, all the way down south of the Jordan River to the Dead Sea. But Jerusalem is far away from Hermon. And so the combination of dew from Hermon in Jerusalem at Mount Zion is a little curious until you remember your history of the people of Israel. We talked about this a little bit last week when in Psalm 132 we heard about the history of Israel and its rise under King David. Well, so David's son was Solomon, and Solomon ruled the kingdom at its highest point, largest extent, greatest wealth. After Solomon... Civil war. The country is split in two. Northern kingdom called Israel, southern kingdom called Judah. And this was one of the great challenges for the people in their consideration of the history of Israel. That they have this like divide in their midst. And yet here the psalmist says when God's people are living together in unity... It's like the dew from the north giving life to the center of worship in the south. Kind of a reunification theme, you see. So three ways that Psalm 133 in its three verses shows us how godly unity is like heaven on earth. But when you spend time with this psalm, you read it and you think about it, it begins to awaken, I think, some hope and dream, and maybe even some vision for the unity of God's people. The more you read this psalm, the more you realize how much unity is a part of God's desire and God's design. And this is what's happened to me through the years. And the first time I heard this psalm was almost 20 years ago. I was in a seminary class, and to begin the class, the professor recited it from memory and I remember hearing the words, and they just pierced my heart. They were just beautiful, this idea of unity. And so for these years since then, I've come back often to this psalm, and it has become more and more a prayer. You know, the psalm itself is sort of an observation about unity. Unity is good and pleasant. Unity is like anointing oil. Unity is like mountain dew. But as you read it, and you live in the world that's so often disunified, you, you realize this is really like a prayer. It's a, in some ways like a prayer for unity at the sibling level. We talked about how the word for God's people means literally brothers. So it's a prayer. People pray for their families, their, their children, their extended families. But also at a local level, you know, I mean, that word for brothers kind of a, applies to the local community. So how many of us have seen relationships and friendships, even within the people of God, fracture over issues and disagreements, divide over stuff. So it's a prayer for the community. And then even at the national level, with that picture of Hermon in the north in the northern kingdom, 
Jerusalem in the south, in the southern kingdom, a prayer for some of the big divides that sometimes we see in our society, praying for unity between north and south, left and right, Gen Z and baby boomers. At times, these divides seem insurmountable. Unity? Yeah, right. Achim, Chaim, kind of feels like a pipe dream. So three points about unity from Psalm 133. The first one is that disunity in the body of Christ, in the people of God, comes from sin. So we mentioned the word, Achim, brothers. If you start looking for that word, brothers, in your Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament, you start to come across some pretty troubling stories. Here's a list. Brief Old Testament history of brothers. First pair of brothers we meet, Cain and Abel. Does not end well. Genesis 4, murder. Yikes. Jacob and Esau literally come out of the womb fighting each other. That's why Jacob's name is Jacob. It means grasping at his brother's heel. They're fighting out of the womb. Uh, Joseph is sold into slavery by his older brothers because, he, uh, because they're jealous of him. Uh, Aaron and Miriam, Aaron the first high priest, and Miriam is the leader of the people of Israel. Sometimes we forget this, but they are Moses' siblings. So in the book of Numbers, when they come to Moses and say, Moses, you're doing a bad job leading, and we don't want you to lead anymore, and we think we should lead, that's sibling rivalry stuff. Brothers. King David and his brothers, tough relationship. His brothers always kind of pushed him down. So, so in that word brothers in the Old Testament, we see actually more conflict than unity. And then you think, well, maybe in the New Testament things get better. Well, we have lots of language about the spiritual family that gathers around Jesus. Jesus says, if you don't gather with me, you're going to be scattered. And we have the lots of language, like brothers and sisters in Christ and, and all that kind of family language. But the early church was constantly dealing with division. You had false teachers. You had bad doctrine. You had like people sinning in the community, creating all sorts of problems. We would not have most of the letters in the New Testament if the body of Christ in the New Testament was just unified. The fact that there was so much division that Paul had to write all these letters and Peter wrote these letters and John wrote these letters. And here's what we see. This little survey of like brothers in the Old Testament and some pictures of spiritual family in the New Testament, uh, we have this assumption that family is just supposed to be unified. Like we, we should be unified. Yeah, I mean, we say this in our own house with our kids, like they're fighting. It's like, why can't you just get along? How many times do we say that? Because we're assuming uh, that if it's family, it should be unified. But the Bible shows us that there is a deeper truth that destroys the assumption of family unity. And here's the deeper truth. Uh, individuals are full of pride and rebellion and so a family is a bunch of individuals put together into a little Petri dish. And guess what grows in that little Petri dish? A bunch of people full of pride and rebellion, wickedness and sin. Some nasty fungus grows. That's what, that's what happens. Some divisive stuff grows in that Petri dish. Anytime you pull people together closely enough to call them family, you have to realize you're calling together a bunch of really flawed people. And before long, the divisive elements of self-centeredness and pride are going to start causing tension and then eventually disunity because of sin. That is, of course, if we're not relying on God to help us to be unified. The good news, and this is the second point about unity, is that the Lord really desires unity for his people. In Psalm 133, it talks about that dew of Mount Hermon coming to Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing. Actually, a better translation for that word might be 
commands or ordains, that, that it is God's desire for Zion and the center of worship to be a unifying place of blessing. From the beginning, God creates the world and the people in the world so that we could all share in the overflow of his love and his goodness. And while we don't, from our human perspective, understand all the reasons why God created the world the way that he did, reading the scripture makes it clear that God created the world in order to gather together a family of people to be his own who would freely receive his love and then love God and their neighbors as themselves. God's after a unified family. And this unified family will delight in God's goodness and so give glory to God. This is kind of like all the way down to the deep purposes of the creation. And this purpose we just talked about really sets the backdrop for Jesus' prayer the night before he was crucified. In John 17, Jesus prays a number of things But at the heart of that prayer are these verses. Jesus says in John 17, 20, my prayer is not for them alone, speaking of the disciples that were with him that night. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Well, that's us, because those disciples saw the resurrected Jesus and went out as apostles announcing the good news, and we find ourselves as a link in that long 2,000-year chain going all the way back to those who started sharing that message after the resurrection. So Jesus prays for us who will believe in him through the message of the apostles that all of us may be one just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prays for the unity of the body. And this is familiar scripture for very uh, many of us. We know this is, this is on Jesus' heart. This is a desire of God. And in some ways, because this is Jesus' final prayer before, in the Gospel of John, the events of the cross begin unfolding, his arrest and trial and everything else. In some ways, this John 17 passage in the Gospel of John shows us Jesus' understanding of why he's going to the cross. And Jesus knows that his death will deal with the penalty of our pride. He knows that his death will undo the separation caused by our disobedience. His death is for the forgiveness of sins. And this is so meaningful because human beings in the Petri dish, with all our selfishness, we hurt each other. And we create wounds that make it seem like unity is impossible. And unless there's somewhere for that pain to go, unless there's some way for forgiveness to be released, unity is impossible. So Jesus going to the cross is offering himself as, in some ways, the collection point for all of the wounds that we inflict on one another and all of the pain. Jesus says, okay, bring it all here. I'm dying for everybody's sins. I'm taking that on myself. You can release your wounds by another person into my care. I will deal with it. I will take it to the grave. I will bury it, and I will emerge triumphant in resurrection, life, and power. That's his invitation at the cross. That's why unity can happen. And when that happens, when Jesus deals with the sin, we find ourselves invited into the very life of God. This is what Jesus talks about, that they are in me and I am in the Father, that somehow that the desire of God is that all of us as God's people would share with God in God's life. And when this happens, when the people of God are reunified in Christ, when sinners are redeemed, when when pride gives way to humility, there is this great opportunity for the world to come to know God. Just like Jesus prayed that if they're unified, then the world will know 
that something miraculous is going on. The world will know that the Father sent Jesus and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is the unity of the body of Christ. This is one of the great witnesses to the world that Jesus and his power is real. Francis Schaeffer, the great 20th century Christian philosopher, called this unity a golden opportunity. In his book, The Mark of a Christian, he wrote, it is in the midst of a difference that we have our golden opportunity. When everything's going well and we're all standing around in a nice little circle, there's not much to be seen by the world. But when we come to the place where there is a real difference and we exhibit uncompromised principles but at the same time observable love, then there is something that the world can see, something they can use to judge that these really are Christians and that Jesus has indeed been sent by the Father. I remember seeing this displayed a number of years ago. I got to go with a group from Grace to Cambodia. And if you know much about Cambodian history, you know that in the late 70s, they went through this horrible time under the violent leadership of the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot. They had the killing fields. They basically wiped out about 20% of the entire population in ruthless killing. Awful, awful, awful period of time. In the aftermath of the reign of the Khmer Rouge, there was a pretty significant revival. And so when we went, we were there to do a little pastor's conference with a bunch of pastors. And so I was hearing their stories, and most of these pastors had lived through that time with the Khmer Rouge, and many of them had lost family members. But then at the end of the pastor's conference, um, they started to they celebrate the end of it by everyone taking communion. We've been together for several days, and so the end of the conference was a collective time of communion, remembering the body and blood of Christ. And one of them leans over and points out to one of the gentlemen who's handing out the communion elements to the people gathered. And it turns out that guy was a high-ranking leader in the Khmer Rouge who had given the green light to the murder of family members of the people gathered. And then there are other people who are part of this pastor's gathering who um, were part of the Khmer Rouge, and you have the people who were experiencing the hardship and pain and murder giving them the communion elements. And, and so it's like blowing my mind because where in the world do these groups of people find unity? They share a blood feud of bitterness between them. And yet, somehow, as they're distributing the body and blood of Christ, that blood feud has been removed. It's been drained of its animosity. And what remains is a miraculous unity. That is part of the golden opportunity to display the unity that comes through Christ in the face of almost impossible to imagine conflict. You killed my family members, and yet now we're unified in Christ. Can you imagine and this language, actually, of golden opportunity, it strikes me because in our day, gladly, we're not living through a crisis like the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, but we do hear a lot of headlines and maybe even sermons and observations about division in our country, that our country's quite divided in many ways. And even within the Christian community, we hear about examples of division between communities. And we could be overwhelmed by that and think we're really in big trouble. Or maybe it's better to think about what Francis Schaeffer wrote, that we're actually living through a golden opportunity as followers of Jesus. You know, we're, we're coming up on an election, like in the next year, all that stuff's going to start swirling up again. Woohoo! <laughs> i got to tell you how much I love preaching October, November of an election year. 
Like how many, how many years have you been a pastor? Three presidential election cycles. That's how I <laughs> measure time. Uh, because people kind of, I mean, we all get pulled into all these different agendas and the world's pulling levers trying to siphon voting blocks into this camp or that group and win an election. But here's the amazing thing. What if in the next 12, 14 months, we took advantage of the golden opportunity in front of us? Like, what a chance we have as the followers of Jesus to be unified, not by a party or platform, but as the people of God. And what a chance we have to be unified, not by a particular candidate, but under the headship of the true king. This is some of God's heart, I believe, for us in the year ahead. God desires unity. And that brings us to the last point. In John 17, Jesus uses the language of gifts to describe the foundation of unity. I've given them the glory. I, I gave it. It's a gift that you gave me that they may be one. So the foundation of unity flows from the gift of Jesus' salvation. It's a grace. But, this is the third point, even though unity is a gift, it is not guaranteed. And you even see this a little bit in Psalm 133. I talked about the recipe for anointing oil. And one of the things Tom Brown brought out in our elder meeting was how every ingredient in the anointing oil, whether it was the cinnamon or the myrrh or even the oil itself, every ingredient had to be processed in some way, crushed, ground up, scraped, soaked, whatever it is. Like, there is a process. You don't just throw it all together, but like, there, there's a process in that anointing oil coming to be the fragrant blessing that it is. Paul writes about unity this way in Ephesians 4. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Even though the foundation of our unity is a gift, it isn't guaranteed. We can squander it. I, I remember growing up playing baseball. I played with a lot of incredibly gifted athletes who just naturally could hit the ball farther, throw the ball faster, run quicker than I ever could. But just because they were so gifted was no guarantee that they would live into their gifts. A lot of times, the most gifted players are the ones who didn't have to work at it, didn't have to make every effort, and so ended up neglecting the gifts that they've been given. Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Unity in the body of Christ can be just like athletic gifting. We've received the gift, but have we made the effort, engaged the cost, in order to preserve or keep the bond of unity from the Holy Spirit? Here is what unites us. Here's what Paul gives as a sort of list of the marks that unify the body of Christ. That there's only one body. We drive around the neighborhood and we see the Methodist church and the Lutheran church and the Baptist church and the Catholic church and the Episcopal church and then you drive past Grace, whatever we are, and you got all these different groups, you know? <laughs> and you see all the different signs out on the road. When God looks at our neighborhood, God sees one body. He doesn't see Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists. He sees believers. He sees the saints. He sees the redeemed. There's one body, Paul says, and that one body is held together and united by one Holy Spirit. And in that Holy Spirit, we share one hope. That is the promise of Jesus' return and the restoration of all things. How can we live through the uncertainty of unity and disunity? It's in the confidence to know that one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to set everything right. And we have one Lord, that that one body looks to one leader, Jesus. And we look to that leader in faith because we have, as Paul says, one faith. And that faith relies 
on his work, not on our own. Yes, we can make every effort to maintain unity, but ultimately, we all come to the Lord as people who are lost and separated from God, who need God's forgiveness through Jesus. Unity is so much easier when we come to the conversation and the relationship with the deep humility of awareness that we are sinners who have been saved by Jesus. And the people we're talking to in the body are also sinners who have been saved by Jesus. And that we are all on our own journeys of being sanctified by the Spirit of God and that we never lose sight of the reality that the first entry point into the body of Christ was as a dead person now made alive. That's humility. Actually, one baptism, as Paul says, that reminds us of that, the sign of our transfer from death to life, one God and Father of all, that God ultimately is the source, and because he is the Father, we are family. This is Paul's brief list of essential basics that we have to know is a foundation of our faith in order to be unified. Now think about the stuff that tends to divide the Christian community. Issues of sexuality, issues of women in leadership, issues of race and justice, issues about politics. Those are not in this list, are they? What does that mean? They don't matter? Does that mean there's not a right and a wrong? No, no, no. There is a right and a wrong. The revelation of the Scripture guides us in our principles, our practices, and our convictions. But the point, I think, from Paul is that we will have no chance at maintaining the bond of unity in the Spirit on those issues I just mentioned that tend to divide us if we are at all fuzzy on the foundational basics of the faith. We've got to know this stuff through and through. It's got to be the defining cornerstone of our faith before we can enter into those next level conversations about all of the challenging and contentious issues of our day. Our approach to those matters, those issues, is important. But there's also a certain simplicity here in what Paul writes. One of our big goals, even here at the church, at Snellville, as we equip one another to follow Jesus well into the neighborhoods, nations, the next generation, is that we keep coming back to the basics, especially with the next generation, intentionally, carefully working with them so that they understand, so that you all, many of you in here, your students, you're doing the family worship thing. I mean, we shifted around our whole Sunday about eight months ago, in order to make more space for training with our students, with our kids, with our adults, and make space for the generations to be together worshiping, like in family worship. All of this, I mean, it comes back to some of this stuff, getting back to the basics. So that when we encounter conflict in the body, when funky stuff starts growing in the Petri dish, we understand the essentials of grace and humility, redemption and forgiveness. If we don't have that foundation, unity is a pipe dream. If we do have that foundation, we can keep the unity of the Spirit. And when we do get it right, when we learn to dwell together in unity, it's like heaven on earth. You know, sometimes you hear these song lyrics or people say things like, well, I'd rather be in hell because that's where all my friends are going to be. No. No, no, no. What we get in Psalm 133 is a picture of what heaven will be like. And heaven is like the best possible time that you can imagine with all your friends and God in the mix. Hell is not the fun place. Uh, heaven is the fun place because that's where God and all the redeemed are. And that's where unity happens. I mean, just imagine the great party you have with your favorite people. That's the picture of heaven. And Psalm 133 says that when we live in unity on the earth, we catch glimpses that we can taste that. There's one last thing to observe out of this passage before we finish. You know, um, 
the word Messiah in Hebrew means the same thing as the word Christ in Greek. Messiah and Christ. Um, each of those words in their languages, it just means the anointed one. Messiah is the anointed one. Uh, Christ means the anointed one. So, so when we say Jesus Christ, we're literally saying Jesus the oily guy. <laughs> or maybe more theologically, we're saying Jesus, the true intersection of heaven and earth. Jesus, the incarnate one, God and human, there. And so this word, like anointing, shows up in Psalm 133. With Jesus, it's where heaven and earth overlap. But then something interesting happened. Because after Jesus is resurrected and he sends up into heaven, the apostles go out and preach the message and people start saying yes and the Holy Spirit starts working and the community grows and now suddenly in the ancient world if you read through the book of Acts there is this new group of people beginning to emerge and grow and it was a little bit confusing because this group of people was not defined by their profession or what guild they were in they weren't defined by how much money they had they weren't defined by their ethnicity, whether it was Jew or Gentile. They weren't defined in the old categories of which God you worship in the Roman Empire. Like, nobody knew quite how to classify these people. And so in Acts chapter 11, in the city of Antioch, as the community of Jesus followers is growing, the city of Antioch, they knew how to give nicknames. They're famous for this. They were masters of identity politics. And so what they did is they saw this new emerging group and they said, what should we call them? Oh, the Christianoi. The Christy ones. The anointed ones. And the name, which became Christian, stuck. And here's what you need to know. If you trust Jesus as your Savior, if you are a Christian, then you are under his anointing. But the Spirit of God is in you, making you a mini expression of heaven on earth. And this is the picture of Psalm 133. This is the hope for our unity. It's a picture of the body of Christ gathered underneath Jesus, who is the head. And from Jesus, the oil of anointing, the Holy Spirit that unifies, that is good and that is pleasant and that is healing and that is powerful, is just is flowing down onto us. All the way out to the edges of the garment, even the fringe people in the body of Christ under the anointing of the Lord at the head. And this is a unified community that's pulsing with heaven's power. And if there's something worth making every effort to attain. I believe it's that. Because when we are unified, the world will see the goodness of God. And, and when we're unified, we will know and live in the good and pleasant blessing of God, even in the midst of a broken world. And when we're unified, God will get the glory. So Lord, we pray that this psalm would not only be inspiring our prayers, but describing our reality. Lord, let us as a people across the generations, across all our different backgrounds, let us as a people who call on your name live in the good and pleasant reality of your unity. And Lord, we turn our hearts toward you. As we do that, maybe, Lord, we recognize places where we are in conflict with others. And I pray that you pour out oil of grace and reconciliation that we might be restored to the unity of the Spirit. And Lord, I pray for the year ahead. Who knows what will come and tempt us to be disunified, but in the midst of that, Lord, give us the strength to make every effort to maintain the bond of unity in the spirit. And thank you for your promise, Lord. And we pray that this community and all of your body in this area and around the world uh, would continue to be 
a place where heaven and earth overlap. In Jesus' name. Thanks for watching this Grace Snellville video. We want to help you get connected to everything happening around the Grace Snellville community. We want to pray with you, and we want to help equip you to follow Jesus well. Would you just take a moment, even now, to go to our website at gracesnellville.com. We hope to see you soon.